Hi, um, in this tutorial we're going to be looking into Chapter 7 and we're going to be looking at how we use information that we know about the firm or that we think will be true in the future to calculate a pro forma financial statement, um, a projection to see what we think our financials will look like in a year. And then we'll also see how we can use that to forecast more than one year of financial statements. Before you get started, I want to make sure that you've read carefully and thoroughly uh, pages 214 to 226 in the text so that you're familiar with why our, um, our financial statements don't look exactly like they did when we're in accounting, um, what these different value drivers mean, so that you understand a little bit about where we're going. So before we start, I'm going to scroll up to get as much of my financial statements and value drivers on this screen as I can. All right, there we go. That seems to work, except for the fact that here I have a couple hidden cells that I need to unhide. Okay, so it doesn't all fit. That's okay, I'll have to do a little bit of scrolling. Bear with me. So our job is to use information that we think may be from historical um, experience, past performance, or our expectations about the future. We believe that these percentages are going to govern our financial statements in the future. For instance, we think that our sales are going to grow at about 15% and that we're going to need 20 cents of current assets per each dollar of sales. We're also planning on paying back $6,000 per year in debt repayments. So we can look at all of these assumptions and use them to forecast our model. Let's get started. Sales at the beginning of the year, or I'm sorry, at the end of last year, our last financial statements said sales were 45000 What will they be next year? Well, it depends on our growth rate. But we can calculate it just like we would if you were using an interest rate, that next year's sales are equal to last year's sales multiplied by 1 plus the growth rate. Hitting Command-T to make sure I have an absolute reference. Just a side note is that Anytime you reference a value driver, you need to use an absolute reference. If you don't, your model will end up looking kind of strange. Um, and as that happens, uh, you'll learn how to fix it, and I will show you how. In cost of goods sold, let me leave out my absolute reference so that we can go back and show you how to fix it. So cost of goods sold is an expense, and since it's an expense, it needs to be a negative number. And it's going to be equal to... What does it say? Cost of goods sold divided by sales is 45%. 45% times sales. And then next we have our depreciation, interest earned, and interest payment on debt. All three of those, we're going to use average balances. For depreciation, we're going to use our average fixed assets between the beginning of the year and the end of the year. So this 47000 represents the fixed assets balance at the end of last year, but that's the same thing as meaning the beginning of this year. So we don't know when the assets that were acquired or sold during this period, when they were acquired or sold. So we assume that the most accurate, without more information that we can get, is to assume that we're depreciating some number between these two numbers in assets. So we use the average. So depreciation, it's an expense, so I'm gonna enter it as negative but it's going to be equal to the average fixed assets at cost. It's okay there that we're referencing an empty cell. So our average is going to be beginning of the year plus end of the year divided by two, right? Somewhere in the middle. We're going to take a middle of the road approach and we're going to multiply that by our depreciation rate. So we think we're going to have about 2,300 in depreciation. So we're going to do the same thing with interest earned and interest payments. Interest earned is not an expense, it's a revenue, but we're going to use the average formula. Interest earned is going to be based on our cash and marketable securities because those are interest earning items. We're going to take the average beginning balance plus the ending year balance divided by 2, multiplied by the 5% return that we earn on our cash, $250. dollars we are going to need to make some interest payments on debt. That's an expense. We're going to use our average formula, our beginning of the year debt plus our end of the year debt, divided by 2, multiplied by our interest rate on debt, 8%, given an absolute reference. So with all our expenses entered as negative numbers, 
have. We can just use a sum formula to calculate our profit before tax, otherwise known as taxable income. All right, then we use to calculate our tax using our tax rate. Since it's an expense, we know that it's going to be equal to the negative profit before tax multiplied by our tax rate, otherwise known as $9,000, which gives us a profit after tax of 25000 minus 9000 or $16,104. So what firms do with their net income, they do one of two things. They retain it in the, within the firm for growth or for buying assets, for advertising, whatever they want to do. And they also give the rest, or they give some, to shareholders in the form of dividends. So we know that this firm has a 30% dividend to payout ratio. And what that means is that they pay 30% of their income to their shareholders as dividends. And since it's an expense, well, relatively speaking, we're going to multiply it by a negative number. So 30% of that 16,000 is 4,800. And that leaves us 11,273 for retained earnings. So that's our income statement. One thing I like to do before I move on is glance to make sure I have absolute references anytime I've referenced something in the value driver. So anything between B15 and B25 needs an absolute reference. So B24, check. That doesn't need one. B23, check. Doesn't need one. B21, check. B22, check. B20, there isn't one here. I'm not going to fix it because I want you to see what happens if you miss one. Cost of goods sold. I, it's not. B19 needs an absolute reference, but it doesn't have one. And B29. So we're going to see when we carry our formula over what happens because forgetting an absolute reference is one of the pitfalls that are common to this process. All right, we need to move down to the balance sheet. I'd like to fit this all so we can see it without me needing to scroll up and down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the cells in the income statement that I'm not going to need. And what that basically is, is interest earned through dividends. I can hide that. Right click and then hide. Now I can see my value drivers, my income statement, and my balance sheet, and I should be able to forecast this year's balance sheet items. So cash is our plug, which means it's the thing that we allow to vary um, in order to make the balance sheet balance. Um, you'll know what that is if you've done the reading. So our current assets. Current assets are things like inventory or accounts receivable. Uh, we know that current assets are going to vary a lot with sales. The more sales, the more current assets we need. The less sales, the less current assets we need. So our current assets are going to be equal to 20% of sales. Otherwise known as $10,350. We don't have information about fixed assets. I've got this net fixed assets at sales divided by sales or net fixed assets or 80% of sales, but I don't have anything about fixed assets at cost or accumulated depreciation. So I'm going to jump down to this net fixed assets, knowing that they're going to be 80% of our sales, which basically says that for each dollar of sales, we need about 80 cents in fixed assets. And that's a multiplication. All right. So here we're going to work backwards because we know that fixed assets minus accumulated depreciation is equal to net fixed assets. Well, we have our net fixed assets and we also know what this year's depreciation expense was. So we can start by calculating what accumulated depreciation would be. It would be equal to accumulated depreciation at the beginning of the year plus accumulated depreciation or depreciation expense throughout the year. Therefore, we know that our fixed assets at cost are going to be equal to our net fixed assets plus our accumulated depreciation amount. I entered it as a minus because I've got a negative number. So that's what we see is that we must have $60,000 in fixed assets at cost in order to have fixed assets of $41,400. So our total assets I'm going to add up is being equal to our net fixed assets plus our current assets plus our cash and marketable securities, which since we have nothing entered there, 
this number of current assets, total assets, I'm sorry, at $51,750, that's going to be understated. Now let's look at current liabilities. Our current liabilities are going to be equal to 15% of sales. And our debt is going to be paid down at a rate of $6,000 per year. So we shall have $24,000 in debt at the end of the year. Our paid in capital, the amount of money shareholders have given the firm in exchange to the owners, doesn't change. <coughs> it won't change unless you're told that it changes, right? So if something doesn't say that it changes, you can keep it the same. And our accumulated retained earnings will increase by the amount of this year's addition to retained earnings. So our total liabilities and equity are going to be equal to our accumulated retained earnings, our paid in capital of common stock, our long term debt, and our current liabilities. So these two numbers do not balance. Our balance sheet does not balance and we wouldn't expect it to. What we need to do is figure out how much cash we have. And we could do it by trial and error, entering numbers and seeing what that does. But that would take a while and Excel can do it for us. Excel just may not want to do it for us uh, because it involves circular referencing and uh, what are called iterative calculations, which means they'll, Excel will try up to say, you know, 10,000 calculations really quickly while you're sitting here in order to find a number that works. In the book, it shows how to turn this on if you're on um, a PC, but here on a Mac, we use Excel to preferences. And then once we're in preferences, I'm going to go to calculations. So if you open it up and it's not clicked, limit iteration, you're going to need to click it. If it's not clicked, it means it's going to go to 100. If you want it to be more than 100 iterations, in 100 tries, basically what that means is it'll try 100 values. We want to just tell it to try more than 100 values. If it takes it 2,000 values to figure out what number fits in there, please, by all means, do 2,000 values. So you're going to click the limit iteration box and then you're going to click uh, OK. Now you can do circular references or now it will iterative calculate for you even if there's a circular reference. So we know that our total assets need to be equal to our total liabilities. So we know, know that cash plus current assets plus net fixed assets needs to equal $54,426. So we can back cash in multiple securities. We can back that balance out by saying that it's going to equal my total liabilities in equity minus my net fixed assets minus my current assets. Now I get $2,706 in cash, quite a drop from the year before. Maybe it has something to do with paying off that debt but my balance sheet balances. So this is the moment of truth when you find out if you put in all of your absolute references. And we know that I haven't, but we'll see how that goes. I grab the corner and I drag it over and you can see that there's a problem here, right? There's something missing. There's a problem if there's something missing like this. There'd also be a problem, say, if your sales didn't change from year to year. So you're going to eyeball your chart as soon as you drag it over and make sure that things increase, right? Sales are supposed to increase. And if sales are increasing, then everything else is going to be need to be increasing. Um, our dividends, our net income. Let me unhide this for us. Our tax, all of these things are going to be increasing and they're supposed to be. If something's staying the same or decreasing, you're going to want to take a look at it because sometimes when something goes wrong, um, it's easy to spot because you're going to go back through and double check that things look like they're supposed to. So net income is increasing. That means dividends will be increasing as will retained earnings. Cash and marketable securities. So everything looks right. My balance sheet balances. I don't see any issues except for these empty cells. Empty cells like that are a sign that you don't have an absolute reference. So I click in that and I see sure enough B19 that's going to be one of my value drivers. That's going to be my percentage 45 percent that is the percentage of sales that gets swallowed up by cost of goods sold. 
And below that, in my depreciation, I see this B20, and that's going to be my depreciation rate. That needs an absolute reference. So once I've changed that, I can just highlight those two cells and drag to the right. And that adjusts our entire spreadsheet. And we're still in balance, and things look good. And that's how you create a pro forma finance set of financial statements and forecast them out for a number of years. We're going to come back uh, with a couple more tutorials to show how we calculate free cash flow and how we use this information to figure out how much a company is worth.